Welcome to the Punk CX Podcast. My name is Adrian Swinsko. I'm an advisor, author, and general explorer of the service and experience space. My guests tend to have just released some interesting research. They run a company that has some interesting tech in the service and experience space. They are part of an organization that is doing some cool stuff, or they run their own business doing interesting things for both their customers and or their employees. That's enough for me. Let's get into the interview. Before we get into the podcast, I want to give a big shout out and thanks to the folks at Text Expander for sponsoring this episode of my podcast. Text Expander is an autocomplete tool that allows your team to eliminate repetitive typing and stay on the same page with just a few keystrokes, allowing you to delight more customers in less time. Check out the link in the show notes to find out more and to get a 20% discount for the first 12 months of Text Expander if you use the code SWINSCO. Now, let's get into the interview. So welcome to the next edition of the Punk CX podcast. With me today, I have Minter Dial, who is an author, a podcaster, a documentary filmmaker, no less, an advisor as well, and a speaker to boot. In fact, he's a man of many, many talents. He's also my friend. Hey, Minter, how are you doing? Adrian, always a pleasure to hear your voice and to hang out with you. Ha! <laughs> Perfect. So... Minter, I never assume that people are sort of loyal subscribers or I've kind of listened to the whole kind of archive of of our uh, of my podcast, which are numbering north of 460 episodes right now. I know which you're this longtime podcaster like I am and you're north of 500 now. So I'm kind of like in, in a audio. Uh, we're in the same boat. We're in the same boat. We're in, you know, I'm slightly kind of behind. But I'm hopefully going to like meet that milestone sometime at the end of this year or beginning of next year. But anyway, you've been on the podcast before, but I just wanted to ask you, for people that haven't had those podcasts before, is like, give us the, the Minter Dial thumbnail sketch. Well, I have more and more, like you said, I've done lots of things, but the fun part is connecting them and and feeling good about how each of them has contributed to some part of me in a manner that's coherent mm-hmm. as opposed to thinking world war ii and tech and empathy and the overriding theme here has always been about inserting meaningfulness into our world mm-hmm. and what i like to say or we'll talk about with my my north star is to elegantly elevate the debate and that's what i try to do through all these different means, whether it's talking about or writing about conversation, empathy, tech, the values of the of the generation that was in the Second World War, and in in society in general, that's um, that's the thumbnail sketch. That's what I want to be doing. I want to be known for. Awesome. Now, we had you back on. The, we had you on the podcast back in. I looked it up actually. Uh, it's back in February two thousand nineteen, um, and we had you on to talk to you about your this new book artificial empathy putting heart into business and artificial intelligence now you've updated it though you've reissued it i've updated it like a lot um but bef- wanted to before i dive back into it because it almost feels like a new book i wanted to ask you about why did you feel the need to update the book and like what's changed and whereas the thesis and the main thrust of the book changed or is it still kind of centered it just there's some things things of parameters have moved and it needed to get filled in with more stuff Tell, give us the was it the 411 is that the right sort of thing uh, yeah, i'm not sure 411 is the information number right the directory um so the overwhelming feeling i had as i sat on the book as one does, is that it was aging with regard in particular to the AI piece Mm. and where we were. When I wrote it at the beginning, I really didn't know just how crazy the idea was of trying to humanize AI Mm -hmm. and or at least render it more effective with human human to machine and machine to human interactions. And three things sort of happened together, which made it feel like I really needed to update. So the first was with regard to empathy. Mm. Sure, I wasn't the first person to write about it, 
But in the intervening years, that's four years, we've seen, I've seen over 300 titles of books with the word empathy in it. So, ooh, Laura, that looks, sounds like a trend, if not a gadget almost. A big so, bandwagon. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I was obviously not the first person to write about it, but certainly feel like I was ahead of the, the wave. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to update it in certain regards with regard to how people are viewing empathy. Second thing happened in between was a little pandemic. And that not only raised the idea of why empathy within business and how and why empathy within society, NHS and so on, it also brought to the fore a whole lot of issues with mental health. Mm. And while we already had mental health issues, it has exacerbated the situation. We have all these kids whose university or schooling years were massively impacted, not to say uh, degraded in terms of experience. And then the third thing, not the least, is actually everything that's happened with large language models and the like, mm. not just chat GPT, but every, every amazing thing that happened in the last two years. And, and that needs to be talked about. So that was, those were the reasons that I felt compelled to rewrite it really. Mm -hmm. And like, how much of a rewrite was it? I mean, um, was it like, like an update or is it like, actually I rewrote most of it? So uh, the, the first piece was updating it for the tech side because mm -hmm. the AI element seems so obvious, but then having reread it, I was like, Oh, there's some things I really need to update, refresh. And there's some studies that are too old or feel dated and I need to update those with regard to like the empathy piece itself. What is empathy and how can empathy be useful? Those things remained largely common. There's, mm -hmm. it's a mechanical thing at some level. You know, how do you insert empathy into a business? Mm -hmm. That's not going to have changed other than the fact that I have some new experiences and things that I've been doing. So it was more of a modest update with regard to the empathy side. Where it became wholly new was the mental health side, because I really hadn't tackled it. At the time in 2018, when I wrote the book, the 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 notion of therapeutic AI wasn't mm. really on the table. Obviously, people are thinking about it, but it it we were far from very far from having anything close to resembling a a proper therapeutic machine. And so that whole mental health and therapeutic AI was completely new. And then the whole other piece with regard to AI in general and the insertion of empathy into AI and machines and how there's been lots of new uh, initiatives, you know, as you know, and we're both friendly with the Pega systems, mm -hmm. what they were doing, but there are many other companies that are now explicitly looking at empathy within the AI component. And so those are the things that I had to update for. So yeah. I, I would say it's around about 70% different really compared wow. to the initial book. That's a, it feels like a new, a new, new book. Well, it, it certainly felt that way from a work standpoint. <laughs> yeah, I know how much effort these things are going to take. I mean, I think, and also it's, um, I think what's fascinating is that the pandemic exacerbated the sort of need for, you know, more em an empathetic approach to the interactions that we have with our customers. But then the, on the flip side, um, it also we show that we see the the as you say the the impact on well being and mental health for people that are trying to help and serve uh, the customers and there is there's a, becomes this two sided sort of like thing so is, it can I think we can all agree that the the need for this is, has has grown over time in the in the face of of the challenges that we've um, that we've encountered along the way but I remember writing about this not in the same kind of depth but at, you know um but thinking about that whole empathy sort of thing and something i've kind of talked about this empathetic musculature kind of along the along the way but i also remember finding some academic research and i think it was research from researchers in penn state and the university of of toronto that looked at empathy and they've said 
they found something along the lines of like the majority has recognized that empathy is important. But they also found that folks believe that empathy is hard work. And because of that, people tend to avoid being empathetic just because of that, the hard work involved. And so um, what I wanted to ask was, given kind of the rewriting and given the old, you know, the, the, the initial ideas, I mean, how can we develop our empathy and and how can we develop it not in, only within ourselves, but also in the organizations that we build and nurture and manage and also the machines and the tools and the systems that we develop? So let me first start by saying, I do think it is hard work. I do think like politeness, it takes effort, but that shouldn't stop us from wanting it. The mm -hmm. challenge is, in my opinion, of how to insert it into business in general. First of all, I, I would insist on the fact that the first piece of empathy should be within the company, in the way you manage with your colleagues, your peers, your employees, as opposed to the external component. Mm. You need to get that part fixed right. Because if you're trying to put in empathy as a way to deal with customers better, have better customer service, have uh, you know more business because you've got the design appropriate for your customers' new products and services. That's all well and fine. But if you don't model or have a congruent style of empathy within the business amongst yourselves, then it's very unlikely that that sort of targeted empathy just towards the outside will actually work. Mm. And so. The leitmotif for inserting empathy into business to be effective and to have people warrant the energy necessary, I like to try to organize it around what is your strategic issue. Mm -hmm. So that gets usually the attention, hopefully, of the, the senior brass, because the top brass typically are the most challenged at being empathic. They're the ones who feel stressed from shareholder pressure. They're the ones who sit from one meeting, one after the other. And inevitably, whether it's through stress, lack of time, and or lack of patience, don't tend to wish to listen. I mean, of course, on top of that, they were brought up typically to be the ones with all the, the affirmative ideas, the decision making. Mm -hmm. So that makes for a pretty poor cocktail in terms of modeling the empathic style of management. So if you if you can say, well, listen, well, our challenge is, let's say, big one, hiring and retaining talent. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that, that's a problem for you, sir. Okay, well, how can empathy be a useful tool within that? And and we, of course, you don't lead with empathy. You, you look at the, the ways to recruit and retain talent and insert empathy where it becomes interesting and necessary within. And I think that is a, a plausible way to deal with the, oh, I don't have the time for it. Mm -hmm. Or you don't have the time for your most strategic issue. Mm -hmm. Huh. I, I also think that it's important not to think of empathy uh, as a something for everything all the time everywhere. Mm -hmm. In other words, you can't just go around and spend all your day listening. Sure, you can have a day of listening, but you can't just be thinking, I'm going to be empathic with everybody all the time, everywhere. You, you have to be pragmatic about these things. But is it not also that, you, it, that we need to also kind of make sure that we understand that being empathic or having empathy is relative and it's appropriate and it's contextual as well? Absolutely. It doesn't mean right. kind of like, ah, oh, give me a hug. Yeah. And they're there. And so on and so forth. It could be that actually there is a there might be a situation which goes, oh yeah, that might require spending a bit more time and a bit more focus and having a bit more, you know, really dialing into something. And it might only be a handful of minutes where other things it might be somebody's in a rush and it's like, bang, I need an answer, yes or no, just then. And that's the most empathetic sort of thing to do. It's about thinking about it. It's not a one size fits all. It's it's like 
it is developing that muscle, that habit, that behavior, that capability to understand what's appropriate and what's contextual for the things that the, 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 the challenges that you're facing, right? Well, agreed. And I, I still say that there are many parts of your day where just don't worry about the empathy piece all the time. Because mm-hmm. if you get so obsessed with it, you can sort of start getting slowed down by it. And worse, in certain cases, impacted by mm-hmm. it. So you're right that it is a, a muscle. It, it should become something you, you reflexively have. But as you say with the context thing, it sometimes will depend on how much data you might have on the other person. Mm-hmm. So that if you're not in a situation of confidence and, and there's no trust, you won't be sharing the information that will make my ability to be pathic more appropriate. So there's a time and a place where I build that into my chat with an Adrian to learn more about his situation. So it's that when I give him an order, if I'm your boss, then it it lands in a place where I understand how you will receive the information. Because there's two things which are really interesting about empathy. Well, the two sides to the coin. There's me thinking I'm being empathic, Mm -hmm. and there's you feeling that I'm being empathic. And at times, there's you don't actually necessarily need the other person to feel that I am being empathic. For example, it can just be uh, a message, or you 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 close somebody's door. Mm-hmm. You went by. I go by your office. Oh, I see. He didn't close his door before he left. I'll close it. You're not going to see that. Mm-hmm. You're not going to feel that. It's just it just happens. Mm-hmm. You know, so sort of. Maybe it's part of our relationship, but that's thinking, well, Adrian would like it if I closed the door. I know that. Mm-hmm. But but you're not going to come back to the office the following morning and say, oh, I got, I forgot to leave. I forgot the, the door was open. I wonder who closed it. Or you put a post on there and go, I close your door. Exactly. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> that's malarkey, right? So this notion of being empathic and feeling the empathy is um, two separate ideas. And 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 I think it's very relevant when you're thinking about customer service or other or or design, mm-hmm. where the empathy is implicitly inserted into the way you treat a customer. It's implicitly inserted into the methods you employ for designing the right product and service. But it's not necessarily said, oh, well, that's a really empathic service from a customer standpoint. No. It's just an effective service, maybe, or it's a cool design. Yeah, I mean, I like to think. Of, I like to think about it in terms of the the uh, the idea of you know. There's a how do people frame it? There's, people talk about the kind of jobs to be done type of an approach, where you think about it, and it's like a customer or somebody has a job that they'd like to be done. Like they have a task that they want to do, or they want to try anything they want to try and achieve. And then it's almost like the the, the there's a there's a measure of how good was your service and in, 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 in helping me achieve that. You know, was it quick? Was it efficient? Was it effective? Was it also polite? Was it respectful? You know, was it understanding? Did it know me? Did it respect me? All these different sort of things. And all of that becomes this bubble of empathy. Which is usually, um, A, not scored in the same way, deliverer, receiver. Mm-hmm. We have different. We all have our different ideas. What is empathy, in terms of what it is in the first place, and then how much of it is where, and and even if I, if I come in grumpy, and even if you gave me the great service, I'm still gonna say, oh sure, sure. And even <clears throat> you and you delivered 100 percent empathy. I'm in a shit mood, and I don't perceive it, and and that's my reality, and it's hard for you to then. Uh, feel good about it because oh, he was a real shit, <laughs> you know. And- mm-hmm. Well, no, sure, and it's it is that sort of thing. It is that um, you have to develop the capability, or I have to think about kind of like how you develop the capability. What's the most appropriate way of kind of doing that? But in the in the in the knowledge that actually sometimes you can't control the outcome because the reality is is there's stuff that happens, and then there's what we make it mean. That's right. right? And so you're a grumpy kind of point. It's like going, I might have done my utmost to deliver that kind of like great service or whatever it might be. And you've just gone. Mint has come back and has been thrashed on the paddle court. And nothing 
nothing is going to make him feel happy right now because he's like going, shit, I should have won that. Race. And I lost it. And it's like going, you might be, but it's just going to cloud or color the rest of your your day or at least kind of like depending on the half-life of your emotion around a, a paddle defeat. And that's where in internally, let's say that that, that situation happens, you uh, also need to have self-empathy, mm-hmm. understand, well, I did, I did my best. Let me brush off this other piece, this, start, this bad mood guy. And, and then there's the empathy within the team, support by your boss who will not just say, oh, you fucked up because the result wasn't good, but you gave it your all and, and show some understanding of, oh, well, it must be very upsetting for, for you having tried your most. And, and, and rather than just look at the result, as we mm-hmm. often tend to, oh, well, you know, bad score, NPS or whatever it was, that might have been the output. But you you at least tried your your best, and you understand the situation as a boss how it went down. There you need data points. You need the time to understand the context of the conversation. If we're just focusing on a, a customer service interaction, and and what's the things that we should be doing to to almost because this feels like a journey, and it's not like a destination in 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 of itself. So to help us gauge. How we're doing on that and build and how we're doing sort of building that capability, whether it's through our culture, our kind of behaviors, our processes and system. What sort of questions should we be asking ourselves to under help us understand how we're doing here? So the very first point for me is about self-knowledge. Okay. So if you are listening and, and you are in a position of management or not you would do well to lean into figuring out who you are, how you deal with your imperfections, the things you're less good at. And, and, and the reason why that's important is that if you have a good understanding of yourself, including your weaknesses, they won't come out like a chip on the shoulder or some uh, cataclysmic uh, sort of, explosion unexpected because you you weren't really mastering your full self and the second reason why that's important is the more you're able to understand yourself the more able you are to get rid of the ego and to dial into the person in front of you be present with them and and know how to manage the things that are issues and trigger you because if you do get triggered by something, you need to be aware of that. And then you need to have the second thing, which is to master it mm-hmm. such that when I'm listening to you, I'm fully with you and the triggers or the issues that I have in the background are moved aside. So this is the this is really the strongest starting point. And when you have that, then you're in a better position to get into the shoes of somebody else. Mm-hmm. If you don't have a... Uh, a certain backbone, the issue then becomes you might do too much of it Mm. and be too much interested or worried about the other person and not worrying or knowing enough about yourself. So it's a balance. And like you say, it's totally a journey, not a destination. Mm. And there are times when you, it's absolutely essential to be empathic. And there are times when it's absolutely unnecessary to be empathic and knowing how to manage that. That's something you gain with experience. Mm -hmm. And I think the um the one one of the things that I've said to people in the past because I think it feels to me like at the root of all of this is about how much attention do we pay almost in the moment um to the other person. So I ask people to kind of reflect on this kind of question, and it says, and the question goes, how many times do you find yourself in a conversation? When during the conversation, you just feel like you're waiting for the other person to stop talking so you can tell them what you think. (laughs) And people can generally go, oh, roll their eyes or bow their heads or whatever. And you go, look at their shoelaces. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Uh And then you go, that's me. uh, Yeah, that's me. And you go, well, if that happened, then you stop paying attention and paying attention and really listening. That's a, that's the kind of the first kind of key. And, And in order to build that awareness, I'm almost, as you say, start with the self-awareness. It's like, stop 
tuning into how many times that happens during your day. And all the conversations that you have is like, at what point do you switch into going, I want you to hurry up and finish so I can tell you what I think. Um, because when you start to think about that, when you start to understand that and realize kind of how much that actually happens, then you're that's a really good first step. And it's it's bloody hard to do. I find myself kind of trying to do it. Um, I catch myself kind of going, oh, no, and just wanting to be able to finish. But it's this, it's like a first step. It becomes this habit, like just tune in, just switch, go like, okay, how much am I listening and how much am I not? I think that's a for me yeah, that that feels like a good a good first step just to to really understand how much attention you're paying to what's happening in front of you. And there are a couple of extra things. One is the awareness of your notification system, your notification center. Yeah, and it's it's um, painfully obvious that lots of people have not gotten on top of the notifications such that there is this binging and buzzing and uh, and they're distracted. Mm -hmm. That makes it very hard in our world to, to be engaged in, and dialed into the person in front of you. And then the second thing is, like you say, it's having this ability to breathe and, and remember the pause that needs to happen here. So that's where the, the muscle piece is coming in. Mm -hmm. So like before this conversation, Adrian, I wrote and I said, are we doing a video uh, that's recorded? Why was I doing that? Well, I, I didn't want to be thinking about whether the zit on my nose, I don't have one, but you know, the, the abstract idea of being worried about my physical presence, mm -hmm. presentation, as opposed to just focusing on the content and the, the chat with you. Mm -hmm. And not that had you said recording a video was happening, it would have changed something, but I would have gotten ready for that thought. Mm -hmm. And then help me to be dialed in, knowing I have video plus audio to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I know you mentioned that a large part of the book or the update of the book or the addition of new material in the book was driven by sort of technology. Now, the biggest thing, I mean, technology is, uh, the development of technology has accelerated over the last kind of few years. And that's been, a lot of that has been driven by what we've needed to respond to vis-a-vis -vis the, you know, the pandemic, particularly this massive switch to digital and being able to work remotely and so on and so forth. And the advent of things like Zoom and Teams and Google Hangouts and all these different things. Was it Google? No, not Hangouts. Google Meet now. Hangouts a thing in the past. Yes. Um, but the biggest thing in the, in the last kind of few months, particularly the, the latter part of 2022 and the first quarter of 23, is the advent of chat gpt and as i like to kind of call them all of the, their muppet inspired namelings like bard it's actually not bart it's bard, bard. and uh, bard and ernie but I, I think it's i think they're all inspired by the muppets or sesame street so how does the advent of all of that change all of this so we need to understand one fundamental thing that actually made this happen what was the change and I don't think there's a sufficient awareness of, of what made these LLMs, chat GPTs and BARDs and such happen. And uh, the, this is the point. Up until around two years ago, maybe three now, but all of the different AI specialists were working on a specific area within AI. Mm -hmm. So you had people who were really good at voice. Uh, recognizing voice and and describing or transcribing that into text. You had people that were looking at eye movement. You had people that were working on the words and understanding words, texts. Mm -hmm. And you had people that were working on heart palpitations and, and how, how to gauge maybe medical things from mm -hmm. certain registers from your body. Mm -hmm. Uh, including diagnosing Parkinson's or diagnosing depression at a ways that were better than doctors. What we've had in the last couple of years is we've these have all now come together, mm -hmm. and and what what's happening is that you're now able to use AI that's able to combine voice to text, 
understanding of text, uh, understanding of eye movement, understanding of the inflections in a voice, which is a specific area within mm-hmm. the AI. And all of these things have come together. And that is what has made a step change in, in AI, which has made it harder for people to really understand what's going on because there's so many different levels, sophisticated levels of AI working on that even the manufacturers, people responsible for the encoding of open AI or whatever, uh, it's it's hard for them to have a total grasp of what's going on. And so do you think the ad, the, the, the emergence of the large language, well, generative AI, let's call it, you know, that has been that the, where the vanguard has been led by uh, ChatGPT. You know, is that going to make? Do you think achieving empathetic kind of interactions with organizations easier, or will it be harder? Or do just we do we have to be careful about a kind of what's your kind of view on it? I mean, because you're deep in this. Um, in this area, I mean, because I think the thing that, that one thing that we probably know is that yes, empathy. We want more empathy in all of the interactions that we have, and you know, the right type of you know empathy, and the you know, and the and the right amounts at the right times. And so that I don't think that that's necessarily going to change. What will change will will be the technology and the situations. So, how does the Chat GPT led sort of generative AI wave affect that? Does it make it easier, make it harder, or is it just is a, a really powerful tool that we need to go, oh, it's a spanner. Now we need to figure out where we're going to put it. Hmm. Well, it's it's as yet still an imperfect spanner, even in its latest uh rendition. So the answer to that is uh with nuance, naturally, because we're talking about humanizing. Things. And to mm-hmm. what extent do we actually understand our own humanity? Do we have a full grasp of what's going on in our own brains? No. Do we, uh, as human beings, interact with empathy amongst ourselves? No. So if that's our context, and then we're trying to insert empathy that we understand of our brain, of, of empathic interactions into a machine, well, we are as fallible as they get. Mm-hmm. So the journey is still going to be difficult. And better with this arrival, because what we're doing is we've now got these huge learning data sets. And for those who are specifically working on this notion of empathy, we're getting more refined in how we tag what is empathy Mm -hmm. and allow, therefore, the machine to understand this was an empathic interaction. This sentence in this context was really good replicate. Mm -hmm. And what they're going to replicate is not the sentence, but the organization of that sentence, how Mm -hmm. people understand that was an empathic sentence in a context, in a conversation. Mm -hmm. And right now, um, I think more and more people are understanding the benefit of empathy. And and of course, it's going to be a, a long road. There's, let's say, as I said before, knowing yourself is an interesting component because if you think you are God's gift empathy, but others do not, well, then it's unlikely you're going to get better Mm -hmm. because you haven't identified any thirst to improve. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and so a little humility will go a long way. Whether, and I, there's statistics that I, I have long been studying around how we tend to rate ourselves above average in both empathy and listening mm-hmm. actually at the same amount 75 percent of us in large numbers think of ourselves as above average whether it's empathy or listening which of course are related yet uh people tend to only think that 12 percent of others are better than average at listening mm. And and statistically, it's unlikely that 75% of us are above average. But yeah. we have this high opinion of ourselves, which happens on a paddle tennis score too, by mm-hmm. the way. But we have this higher opinion of ourselves. So I characterize that, or I flag that as a, a less accurate 
understanding of yourself. Mm -hmm. In any event, when you're in this interactive mode with somebody else and you're trying to be empathic, well, if you go into it with some humility and therefore an acceptance of under, wanting to listen to the other person and say that the other person's words are of value at least as much as mine, if not more, then the chances are you're going to listen better into it as opposed to jumping in and interrupt, interrupting with, ah, my, my thought. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's absolutely. It's the, the idea of just like uh, check your ego or um, that your, your status or your position or your level of experience doesn't confer absolutely anything onto you. You know, it's um, and somebody's perspective is their perspective, and um, and it's worth paying attention to. You might not agree with it, um, and it might not necessarily be kind of right in the moment, but that's not the point. The point is, it's their perspective, and actually paying attention to that and listening to it and giving it the respect is um, that it deserves. No, is well giving them the respect they deserve to be heard is uh, I think is important, and I think that's the thing is, is that as you rightly say, is that that the uh, we overestimate our prowess in all sorts of different areas, um, but actually that's one of the biggest barriers to that. And so actually being a bit more, as you say, having humility and. Um, and approaching things in that sort of open and interested sort of way. I kind of like remember talking about this, coining this thing about this a number of years. I think something I wrote about in um, sort of like how to wow. I said, talked about this sort of described relationships as having these two dynamics over and above this, some of these foundational sort of elements and these two dynamics being interesting and interested. And I described it in a way that to, to help people understand it was said that he said, imagine going to a social situation and then there's somebody that's always kind of regaling people with stories about kind of what they've done and their heroics or scrapes to be getting into. And that's kind of interesting. But if they only ever talk about themselves beyond a certain point, it gets a bit boring. Um so that's one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, there is this other side where people are interested and at most they're always asking questions. Now, that might be really useful at certain points in time, but taken to its extreme could possibly also feel a bit creepy. And you're like, you're, you're interrogating me, but I don't know anything about you. And that's the kind of thing. And so it's, you've got to strike that balance about interesting and interested and understand that that balance will change depending on context and who you're who you're kind of like with, and that's going to run away. I find I find kind of like useful to sort of describe it is to think about even from a almost like a marketing and a comms perspective is ask yourself how much of your marketing is trying to be interesting, and how much of it is trying to be interested, and if it's all trying to be interesting, then Maybe you just you've just ended up being portraying yourself just being this slightly narcissistic kind of brand that's all that all you're doing is going, look at me, look at me. And actually a little bit of balance in that might improve the engagement that you have. Just as an example. Yeah. Well, on balance, I think that most people tend to think of themselves as more interesting than they really are. <laughs> And being interested, providing it's with integrity, like it's a yeah. real interest, generally speaking, the person they're interested in will tend to think very highly of the other mm -hmm. person, even though they know diddly squat about him or her. Mm -hmm. Just because they listen to me, oh, they're really lovely. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think it's, I, I used to think it's, I thought it was an interesting sort of just Almost like a play on words type of thing. These two, these two different kind of things. Um, but um, anyway, so the new book. Where can we get it? Are we get it? Uh, can we get it at uh, the the big rainforest? Indeed, bookseller. 
Yep, southern southern uh, Argentina, wherever. No, Brazil, um, of course. Yes, and here's a thing I wanted to tell you is that um, I also translated it into French. <gasps> uh, yeah, and here's the, here's the funny part about that, talking about the sort of the work and why it updated more than I expected initially, was that I I had wrote the French the English one, updated it, got it all settled. Then I moved to the French one, and in the rewriting in French discovered some things that I also wanted to then reinsert into the English one. So I then had this ping pong moment where I was updating both separately, trying to do find the right studies, one in French, one in English and all that. And it made me dial back into the English one to write it more differently. Then I, in my first updated draft, if you will. And uh, so that was, uh, so the, yes, it's available in English and in French. And in the French version, it's got lots of French specific thoughts with regard to mental health and the different uh, studies that are available. And um, so I want to ask you about that, because I think that's really interesting. I was writing a book and actually many people write books and then, they're, then they're, they are translated. But actually you've done the translation in large part yourself. And then kind of adapted it. And what I wanted to understand was that because actually there's a there's both a language and a cultural difference in context. I assume kind of here because we talk about you know there's di- different words in different languages can mean slightly different sort of things. And so kind of what did you learn about the differences kind of between those kind of kind of what I mean? I'm because I'm just curious about it. Not be not be not being somebody who's kind of like who's kind of fluent enough in in languages to be able to do that. You you speak Arabic, mm, well, um, yes, indeed. And um, what I can say is that it's a whole effort to to write the book in another language. It's not like I just copy paste it and and then you know it's and French has the peculiarity of only having eighty thousand words compared to up to a million, depending on how you count them in English. Mm-hmm. And so you're naturally, first of all, the book is is uh, is roughly 30, I think it's 34 pages longer in mm-hmm. French. Okay. Yet it's the same content. So that goes to the the way it's more flowery when you describe things. And it it made me keenly aware of the challenges of, of getting the right technical uh, words translated, trying to figure out what, acceptance of English words would be allowable in a French book. In other words, I I didn't want to be sort of an arrogant English speaking translator and assume that everything should be in English because that's what it is. For example, in code, a lot of coding is done in the English language in -hmm. China, England, everywhere, or France, because that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. That's the terminology, the syntax is that way. Yet there are other words that are you know, can be translated into French. So I can say it was um, a challenge to to write it in, in French. And uh, it made me feel nervous about mm-hmm. some of my deeper knowledge of French. It's It used to be, I used to consider it basically my first language, mm-hmm. but it's I, I now feel that English is the dominant language. But I'm obviously clear, and I did have my wife help me, Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot. And by the way, I had to resort to other people really to help me understand what is this, how do we get to this saying in another language? Contextually, Mm -hmm. the sort of the metaphors are very different, which is what I studied when I was at university. And so Mm -hmm. it was kind of a fun exercise. And I will say also that I did a translation of my book on leadership into French as well, Mm -hmm. at the same time, by the way. So I, all three books appeared in the same three weeks. Or published in the same sort That's um that is a big bag of rocks to be carrying around for a while. But I just think I think it's important to to, to also just to add a bit of a dimension to it because it makes me think about how it makes me think about when we deal with big organizations um that are multinationals or international you know, organizations and they have a lots of different customers from lots of different places and lots of different kind of employees similarly from lots of different kind of places. It seems to me that the lesson from all of that is not to make any assumptions 
about what things kind of mean um around it's like it's not just like a this is what it means and then it's it's the same thing across the piece but actually that's like, almost that like one thing is almost like oh, right we need to pay attention really pay attention and not have this you know um be blinded by the assumptions that we make um and i'm a as you know, I'm a bit of a lover of quotes, and 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 there's one quote that came from a speech that Alan Alda made, which it's about assumptions, and he says, "Our assumptions are our windows on the world. We should clean them off every once in a while so we see clearly." And I think that's particularly appropriate here when we're talking about empathy and we're talking about different types of people and cross cultures and cross languages, and you know. And what it is we're trying to do, and how we're trying to help people. And so, I just thought I'd add that. But it's fair play for doing the translation, and or rather the writing in French. It does bring up this um, for me this notion of of the challenge for CEOs who are, let's say, on the bandwagon for empathy, because there's pressure, and you have to make decisions, and and sometimes you need to be able to make decisions that are not popular or are uh, going to make some people unhappy mm -hmm. and, and and we still need to be able to do those so there there's one overriding typical myth is thinking that empathy is all about being nice mm -hmm. and it is not it's really about understanding and and as an ex example of how that is translated into the minds of so many CEOs there's a study that came out in 2022 that suggested that 79% of CEOs believe that they will lose respect if they're too empathic. Mm -hmm. And and so we have to juggle this notion of needing to be executive, needing to take decisions, needing to sometimes take decisions which are unpopular with this idea uh, that you can deliver it in an empathic way without losing respect. It's like, Brene Brown says, you know, this notion of vulnerability mm -hmm. is actually a tremendously courageous way of being. But you don't want to be vulnerable all the time and, and moping and weeping and and just being in listening mode because mm -hmm. sometimes you got to do shit. Yeah, yeah, You've got to take decisions. So it's it's finding that nice balance between both because uh, otherwise you're trying to be everything to everybody all the time, not going to happen, not going to work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, Minter, um, if I was to ask you to wrap this all up and say, well, look, the things I focus on in, on the podcast is around service and experience, both kind of customer and employee experience. And I, w I was to say to you, right, Minter, complete the sentence. And it goes, the sentence goes, if you would like to become a more empathic individual and or organization that will help you improve your customer and or employee experience then you should do this dot 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 complete that sentence you should listen more boom there you go and um well thank you i mean it's it's a hard i mean also i recognize is that listen and listen and listen and listen but listen without actually i mean really listen like we said before is like and listen to what's being said and how it's been said and when it's been said and and all those different things, because it'll tell you a lot. Yeah, let me um, just describe a, a situation. So when I say listen more, it is uh, what I imply behind that is listen deeply mm -hmm. and listen without judgment. Mm -hmm. So in the deepness is is looking at all the nonverbal cues, trying to figure out what are the other aspects of context that mm -hmm. go into the, the words that are coming out of your mouth or the emotions that are coming out of your eyes. And and then uh, without judgment, so that you're really trying to figure out the perspective of the other, why and how they came to it, and what they're expressing, what they're feeling, and um, and that's uh, it takes it takes a first of all a level of self knowledge and some time. So the other day I had a a round table with twenty five CEOs, and so they're all competitive CEOs, mm -hmm. and. We in the beauty industry in particular, and we were addressing a situation in the industry that actually affects everybody, which is the challenge of finding and retaining talent 
mm-hmm. which a lot of industries are struggling to find. So how do we have these folks combined together? And so what I did is I imposed on them a need to listen to one another mm-hmm. through the technique called the empathy circle, which I've taught you about. And I think you've even done one with me. And it was remarkable that, well, first of all, I heard many of the CEOs saying, oh my gosh, it was really hard to listen. Mm. So I think that's relevant to under, to recognize how hard it can be to listen deeply without judgment of somebody else. Because the person in front of you, in this case, they have context, they have history. Oh, that he's a shit for, you know, I don't like that person. Or his business is harder and they're doing better than mine or whatever other background thoughts you might have. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a, a r- wonderful experience because not only did they listen, they actually felt more connected to one another. Mm-hmm. And if we could do a little bit more of that, I don't want to be like Kumbaya and we all need to connect and love everybody. That's that's hopeless. That's silly. That's won't work. But a little bit more, it can be remarkable what you can come up with. And outside of being better for the industry, as a person, you still seeing better because you might practice that sort of listening deeply, for example, with your spouse or with your kids or, or with your cousin who you've always had fights with. Uh, but if you can go back into it and and then reassess why or how they've come to where they are, you, you'll you'll connect into them better, and they will understand or appreciate you differently as well. Awesome. Um, so, a couple of quite final questions, just kind of conscious of the time, um, Minter. You know, we've had last time we were, had you on the podcast; it was two thousand and nineteen. And a lot has happened in the last four years. And that's probably the understatement of this episode. Um, and it's been both challenging and a bit weird. Um, but what's been the biggest lesson or lessons that you've learned over the last kind of few years that will, will in, it is informing how you do things go forward? Well, I think that we've... We are human beings like habits, and mm-hmm. it'll it'll take consciousness to to break down some of the habits. So I'm uh, ever popular, no, no, positive on the the opportunities that lie within psychedelics to help us explore our consciousness. Mm-hmm. The opportunity for well people to feel better, not just the pathologies to be fixed. So I'm I'm very optimistic about the research that's been done during this period. Uh, with regard to psychedelic assisted therapy for things like depression, PTSD, anxiety, fear of death, Mm -hmm. and addiction. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also think of it as a great opportunity for us in general to to have a more expanded consciousness. And and I say this without this notion of, you know, we've got to embrace every tree and love every person. I I try to be rather practical about it, but it's a glorious thing once you do expand your consciousness. And I think it would do well for leaderships to do that. Again, with a complete understanding that it's about performance as well. You you can't just sort of brush off these pieces. You need to know both uh, at the same time. (laughs) Otherwise, you serve no purpose. Yeah, so I think that's the the main piece that I've seen. I see, I think I, I've enjoyed a lot of interesting conversations. I've seen in the post pandemic, so many people really are loving having deeper conversations. Mm. We invite those, uh, and of course, there's still all the the divisiveness. So how do we manage that? And uh, so I, I practice this every day. I try to bring people together. I try to listen deeply to why somebody is so irate or so steadfast on certain policies or, or beliefs and just try to understand where and how they got there. And maybe that'll give me the key to helping them unplug or at least to move along. Perfect. Um, and the final question is that I know that we said that the, you know, the last few years have been so challenging and weird, but we're sort of not out, out of it and it's still challenging and weird out there. And, and, uh, I find myself trying not to doom scroll, uh, you know, on a over my morning kind of coffee. And so as a counter to that, what I've been asking people at the end of these kind of podcasts is to, is to at least the most recent podcast, is to share with me a good news story so we can end on a positive note. So, Minter, what's 
the most interesting, positive, or exciting thing that you've seen in the last week? Well, the the the, the thing I wanted to tell you about actually, Adrian, is that last week, um, and it's sort of this self servingness to this, so that's why I hesitate. But um, I my the film I did uh, PBS in America uh, mm-hmm. last week reached out uh, to re-sign it. And and what I liked about it was, uh, I mean, of course, it's my film and yeah, great. But the the values. That's the last ring home, by the way, anybody who's listening, if you want to look it up. That's right. The, the reason why it was encouraging was that they kept on, they talked about having the viewer feedback, the readership mm-hmm. or viewer feedback. And what I like about that is that the, the film attempts to put in front of us some values that are are strong and have sometimes been cast aside i would say you know we 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 think that the modern world is the old world is all bad and 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 yet there's some real need for perspective on the issues that we're facing today and the, i can't help but think that people who fought in the second world war would have a different slant than many of us on how things are happening today and how we get very upset about the least uh, important things, whether it's a scratch from my Audi or a broken finger, woe is me. We need to get a little bit more resilience. And this is something that I talk about in Artificial Empathy, the second edition a lot, is how can we have more perspective on what we're doing? Because with that perspective, we'll be so much richer in our minds and our hearts and understand how we can deal with better resilience with the issues that we were just talking about. So I'm I'm uh, I'm encouraging people to 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 read Hans Rosling, uh, which is all about factfulness and gaining better perspective, uh, which will help us much better than a therapy session or a pill from some pharmaceutical company in dealing with these challenges. And and it's okay that we're not perfect. It's okay that we will suffer pain and risk and and death ultimately. Uh, This is our journey and it's a beautiful thing. Well, on those words, we will call it a day, shall we? Thank you very much, Adrian. Thank you very much for sharing your your time and uh, and insight with us. Thank you. I mean, congratulations on the the surfeit of books that you have coming down the pipe or are emerging from the pipe, you know, both in English and in French. Um, You're a busy man indeed. But yeah, just thank you Again, once again for sharing your time with us today. It's been awesome. Lovely. Thank you, Adrian, for having me back on. Wow, what a great interview. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Find out more about me and the work that I do at adrianswinsco.com. Do leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. And if you have any comments, feedback, or questions about the podcast, then feel free to send me a message to podcast at adrianswinsco.com. And do tune in again. Thanks very much.